I went down with my friend the centurion to the harbour of Kafar Nahum. It was a poor place, a curved inlet shut off from the lake by a dam of stone blocks, for though the waters of Gennesaret are usually quiet, they are capable of violent storms which threaten the foundations of the houses near the shore. Fisher folk sat in their boats not far from the water's edge, and in one place on the sandy beach we saw a crowd gathered. All about the labour and commerce of the harbour went on. Women had stretched out the fishing nets of their men and were mending them, while the men, naked to the waist, for it was full springtime and it was hot in the low-lying region of Gennesaret, dragged baskets and pails of fish from the beached boats to the land, spread them out on the flat stones covering the tables, salted them, then laid them to dry on beds of palm leaves on the ground. Other half-naked men carried on their mighty sun-tanned backs sacks of grain, baskets filled with fruit and bundles of vegetables, the produce of the rich Valley of Jezreel, brought to the harbour on donkeys and loaded them on to the barges and sailboats. Tax collectors went about their business from group to group. Buyers chaffered with farmers, overseers drove the fish dryers to work faster. But in the midst of all this to do, we observed how, from time to time, a man would steal away from his work and join the crowd which was assembled about a teacher or interpreter of the law, Then someone from the crowd would steal back to the porters or fish dryers and tell them, with excited gesticulation, what he had just heard. I was eager to approach, but my friend warned me to be careful, for though we were in civilian dress, that is, the toga, they would take fright, thinking that we meant to attack them, and would scatter. We therefore drew near very slowly, and took up our stations under a fig tree, a little distance from the crowd. To one side of the harbour, and close to the water's edge, there stood a few withered fig trees. At one time there must have been in this place a grove or a garden alley, which the waves of the lake had gradually washed away. Nothing remained now but these wretched remnants. In the high spring, when nature blossomed out from under stone and sand, these fig trees remained naked. Only a twig turned green here and there near their summits. The women hung their nets from the branches. Farmers tethered their asses to them, and the patient animals nibbled at the bark. There is not a more desolate sight than a naked fig tree which stretches out crippled branches like the hands of a crucified man falling from the cross. Under such a tree I saw standing a young man, surrounded by fishermen, dryers, porters, and even country folk who had just brought their wares to the harbour of Kafar Naum. They were a strange sight, these simple people, with their implements of their trades in their hands, the fishermen with their hooks, the porters with their baskets, the peasants with their staves, which they used on their donkeys— On every face that was visible from our vantage point, joy was poured out. Heads and beards nodded in happy confirmation. Some of the men, for sheer delight, scratched their perspiring backs with hook or staff. They winked ecstatically at each other with their twinkling black eyes, and the nodding of their tangled beards and wind-hidened faces was a continuous accompaniment to the words. What astonished me most was to see that certain tax collectors stood in the crowd, and no one moved away from them. Among the Jews, tax collectors are regarded as sinners, and few wish to consort with them. But here they were among the rest, in a ring of brotherhood about the speaker. The crowd grew larger from minute to minute. Workers seized a moment of leisure to run over and catch a few words, like a thirsty man running to a spring for a gulp of water. Close to the shore, almost grounded, were several fishing boats, in which men stood up, barefoot, their bronzed faces tense, their throats exposed, listening from a distance. Others sat, their black-bearded faces in their hands. In the breathless absorption of the crowd, Our slow approach, the centurions and mine, seemed to pass unnoticed. I am compelled to admit that the first impression made on me by the young man was altogether extraordinary. 
It was a contradictory impression, compounded of equal measures of reality and unreality. There was, to begin with, his figure and pose, his manner of standing with outstretched arms under the spreading branches of the naked fig tree. I judged him to be some thirty years of age. His body was lean and hungry-looking, as Yochanan's had been, but it lacked the power and musculature of the enthusiast I had seen shortly before his death in the fortress of the Tetrarch. No, this man had the body of a strengthless child, even though he was taller than any of his listeners, for his head, set on the long and slender neck, rose clear above the crowd as though he were standing on a little elevation. The face was of a strange pallor, the skin delicate so that the veins of his temple showed clearly, but his expression was so lively that it imparted to him a look of extreme youthfulness. A young black beard, which mingled with the ritualistic earlocks hanging down at either side, framed his longish face and accentuated its pallor. His garb, which covered him, after the manner of the learned, from the opening at the throat down to the feet, was white. Over it he wore the sleeveless blue-white tunic, with the ritualistic fringes hanging down almost to the ground. Thus he stood under the naked fig tree and preached in the Aramaic jargon of the people. I would have understood him much better if he had not woven into his discourse so many verses from their ancient scriptures in the original Hebrew, but it was clear that everything he uttered, whether in Aramaic or Hebrew, was meant directly for the poor people who surrounded him. They were words of comfort, as one might have guessed without understanding him at all, from the happy faces, the open mouths and the radiant eyes of his listeners. He told them that they were the salt of the earth, and that salvation would come from them. Blessed are the meek, he said, for they shall have the kingdom of heaven. There it was again, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. Then he quoted something from their scripture, which the centurion translated for me. The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those that dwell in the land of the dead have been illumined by a great light. Then, suddenly, all the faces flashed into ecstasy. I could not hear what he said, but it must have been something unusually wise. He is explaining a beloved parable, my friend whispered. And, just as suddenly, the picture was broken up. On the further side from us, a rain of blows descended on the heads of the crowd. Whips whistled in the air. There was a frantic scattering and scampering, and we saw the overseers flailing about them. Faces glowing with bliss changed their expression abruptly into one of terror. Fishermen and porters snatched up hook and basket and fled. But there were some who, whether they were not day laborers like the others, or were so transported by the preacher that they were oblivious to their surroundings, remained standing in their places, waiting for more. The overseers raised a loud outcry. Why does he come here to confuse and mislead the workers? Does he not know that they are day laborers? The day of the day laborer belongs to his master, the chief of the overseers shrieked at the preacher. Thou hast said, answered the other, a smile breaking over his pallid face. The day of the day laborer belongs to his master. But no one can be called master and lord, save the lord of the world, and our days belong to him. To what may this be likened? He wanted to speak on, but the chief of the overseers shouted him down. If you have pretty sermons, keep them for the synagogue on the Sabbath. The working day is no time for them. Another voice entered the dispute. It came from a dark-robed man whom I had observed out of the corner of my eye during the preaching. He had stood to one side, absorbed in the scene. He said, weightily, It is against the law to disturb the day-laborer during his labor, even in order to preach the Torah. He was, as the centurion informed me, the chief presiding officer of their synagogue. On the Sabbath just past, there had been a dispute between him and the present preacher, and now the populace were obeying the latter. Encouraged by the support of the synagogue dignitary, the overseers became louder in their attacks on the preacher. We'll drive him out of here, the lawbreaker. 
will have him up before the court for damages. I cannot tell how the scene would have ended if there had not suddenly appeared around the preacher a group of men making up a sort of bodyguard. One of them I had noted as he sat in his boat close to the shore, a black-bearded Jew with broad shoulders, of low stature but powerful build, compact and sinewy like a tree root. He stretched out his veined and muscular arms in front of the young man. Several others like him, fishermen, with hairy, uncovered breasts and tangled beards, had left their nets, joined him, and made a protective circle about the preacher. The harbour is a public place and belongs to everyone, and not only to the contractors, one of them yelled. Whoever wishes to preach here has the right to do so. But the man who was the centre of the tumult stood there as though he had no connection with it, and did not perceive what was taking place around him, or hear the words meant for him. He had fixed his gaze on the first fisherman who had come to his rescue. I saw the great dark eyes scrutinising the simple, commonplace countenance, and I saw the other shrink back as in fear from the scrutiny. The two men stared at each other for a while, in silence. Then the fisherman took the preacher by the hand and led him away from the crowd as one leads a child. A long time the fish dryers watched the two men as they moved off till they were swallowed by a shadow of a street. Then I heard them talking among themselves. All this because he befriends us, the poor folk. They hate him for it. He brings us comfort. Who else is there to talk to us as he does? He is the prophet Elijah, for he heals the sick as Elijah did. Enough, enough, shouted the overseers. The rest of it you will hear in the synagogue. Back to work. You have wasted enough time today. But the men still looked longingly in the direction taken by the preacher and his friend. They are right, of course, I said to the centurion, whose eyes were as dreamy as those of the others. Who? he asked me, starting. The overseers, of course. These men are day laborers. They are being paid for their time. And here one comes and makes them idle away the hours. He turned on me a strange, mournful gaze. Yes, he murmured, he disturbs men at their work, as the sun and the spring disturb men with their joy and consolation. I did not understand, my friend. In any case, it was high time to leave, for the crowd of workers had begun to observe us. They were undecided in their attitude. My own face, a stranger's, alarmed them, but they were reassured by the presence of the centurion, a well-known and friendly figure in the town. Let us go, I said. The Jews will begin to think we are going to convert to their faith. You know how they are. If we stay another moment, they will become altogether too familiar with us.